Hello friends, welcome to a new episode of the Building Resilience series. Today we will think about organizations from a unique perspective that of complex living organisms. My guest is a prominent management scholar, Daniel Levinthal, Professor of Corporate Strategy at Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. We will reflect on the link between evolutionary biology and organizational resilience, whether today's cleverness will be good enough for tomorrow's crisis, why and how a mind of skepticism and renewal will keep us resilient. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and message me in the comment section below. Hello, Dan, and welcome to Building Resilience. I'm honored to be hosting you. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. <laughs> I've been reading your papers, and I'm looking forward to discuss some of the theoretical knowledge that you have. And I'm very curious in some insights, especially for 2020, and what, what we can do to really become resilient as, as organizations and as individuals as well. But first, just to have everyone a bit get to know you better, can you sure. introduce your interest in studying organizations and how did you start doing that? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, you know, it's, I reflect, I mean, some ways you kind of go way back to my backstory or origin story at some level. So, um, uh, my dad was a faculty member at Stanford and as a byproduct of that, I grew up in the Silicon Valley of the 60s and 70s, uh, which was kind of a special place, special time. Uh, this incredible creative engine of innovation and dynamic capitalism. Um, and I think that at some level kind of imprinted a little bit both my interest organization and the particular uh, lens I take. And maybe it's worth kind of unpacking that a little bit. And I think it might, might introduce some of the other topics. So, um, so Silicon Valley is this amazing place, but it's not as if there's like some central planner who said, oh, the mayor of Silicon Valley, in a way, in 1965, maybe we should do technology and so on. Uh, you know, what did it have? It had some good university. There was Stanford in the South, Berkeley East Bay. It had terrific weather. So people didn't mind moving there, <laughs> living there. Uh, and I suspect, you know, I was, um, you know, young, mostly growing up in the seventies, older siblings of the sixties, uh, you know, the certain cultural zeitgeist of what's challenge norms, whether it's how one lives, maybe how you, how you, uh, build organization. And, um, it's interesting you kind of think about that history in a more concrete way. So I think it's interesting to take two, two touchstone terms, the obvious one and a completely non-obvious one. Okay. Uh, you know, the obvious is Hewlett Packard. So, um, Dave Packard, Bill Hewlett, graduate Stanford. Their advice is, oh, you know, maybe I'll stick around, start a firm. And they can, okay. And it becomes this iconic firm that continues in some form to this day and develop uh, both technology and management practices. Um, but a different firm is, is Shockley Semiconductors. So William Shockley is the innovator of the transistor at Bell Labs in New Jersey. He innovates and decides, I'm a little miffed at Bell Labs. Why don't I move back to Palo Alto? Nice area, good weather. I'll start a firm. That is the actual first semiconductor firm. It is a complete failure. It turns out, Shockley, yes, well, he's a scientist, but it turns out he's actually truly crazy. He's literally paranoid. He is a lie detector. He's about racist with all sorts of bizarre ideas. So, Pretty much everybody leaves his firm. <laughs> and they start a firm called Fairchild. And a few years down the road, Fairchild semiconductors, core employees, um, Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, um, they, they, um, they leave and call, start a company called Intel. So I think what's kind of intriguing is, you know, to paraphrase Homer and, and talking about Helen of Troy, Shockley semiconductors like, you know, the failure that launched a thousand ships, right? And I think this idea of failure begetting kind of progeny, yes, we have success, but overall it's this kind of interesting flux and trauma. And, and in my work, at some level, I try to take that kind of sensibility, but bring it inside organization. So Silicon Valley is this sort of macro phenomenon at the population level, things are being born and they die. And I try to bring a little bit of that sensibility. Well, organization, they renew, they have initiative. We last year we were doing this. This year we're going to be doing something else. And so this idea of sort of 
the organization of these systems that's complex adaptive systems. Um, local rationality, people try to be clever, but nobody really designing the system, but in aggregate, possibly having some interesting collective and properties, and particularly collective adaptive properties. So it's it's I, I kind of feel like there might have been some subliminal imprinting that is, you know, with the latency effect kind of, oh, this is this is how I think about the world. And where did the interest in learning and adaptation come from? You might have just well chosen leadership, right? Following the following the example the example with the semiconductors. Yeah, so I mean there's right happenstance of one's lived experience. So I mean I think I I um maybe more about me than needed to be, but I, I started out in economics and you know, partly as somebody who liked formalism, think about social systems. And I lucked out or got exposed to the work of Jim March, who's an you know, eminent scholar, sort of a founding figure, to be able to hear the firm. And so sort of Jim's particular intellectual imprint, it resonated. Oh, yes, firms are adaptive. That's that's the challenge that I want to um, kind, kind of think about. And again, if, I, if we go back to the Silicon Valley imagery, that is... Um, you know, the neoclassical model is of, uh, well, we have these rational actors who are solving problems, and we know we identify behavior through identifying some equilibrium. Um, well, that's that's not you know, the lived experience or the you know, what would seem, seem to be going out there. Um, and so I I moonlighted with Jim and I kind of left the mother church of economics and, and kind of became uh, a behavioralist, but in particular a behavioralist, yeah. But also influenced by these ideas of complex and systems. So it kind of resonated with my journey. How did you get to the influence of evolutionary biology? Yeah, so I think um, um, a couple of respects. So there's a particular imprint of you know academic forefathers, people like Nelson and Winter and their work in economics. There had been this exciting work, you know, 90s at Santa Fe Institute, and complex data system. But to circle back to your your agenda, resilience, okay. less about me, more about uh, you and your viewers. Um, you know, evolutionary biology has been working on the resilience problem for some four billion years. <laughs> okay, uh, there might be something to to, to be learned there, uh, and and this sort of challenge of a dynamic open system. Entities engage in some mixture of competition and mutualism. Well, that's kind of the evolution of biology problem. And again, if I, you know, what's the alternative broad conceptual framework I might use? I could, you know, uh, my starting point in economics. Well, that, you know, particularly for me as a theorist, microeconomics kind of approaches by the sort of dirty secret of microeconomics is you assume the world is sufficiently simple. That I can characterize behavior, you know, I can I can characterize the optimism. Um, that was economics. You hear say why biology or biology? Well, economics, if you look at its early history, quite clearly borrowed from the tyranny in physics. And in physics, you know, instead of solving for the um, low energy state, you solve for the maximum, <laughs> you know, utility or profits. So you, there was a there was an arbitrage from sort of simple. Newtonian physics to the problem of economic organization. And at some level, I'm suggesting, well, maybe a different arbitrage. Maybe the arbitrage, not obviously the literal sense that individuals have, have a kind of um, capacity for thought, foresight, anticipation, uh, that, you know, a uh, uh, microism is, is not going to have. Um, but as a general orientation of sort of, uh, challenges of, of sort of emergent path dependence and, and, and multi-layer selection processes kind of sound to me a little bit like the organizational challenge. You already started to introduce the subject of resilience, and definitely this is why we're here today. So how do you view organizational resilience through the lens of learning, adaptation, and evolutionary biology? Yeah, so, um, you know, for the you know, Part of the fundamental resilience problem is my, you know, we need to eat and survive today, uh, but we also have to kind of figure out ways to, to operate in some, some proverbial future tomorrow where circumstances indeed might be, be different. Uh, 
And that's that's a dual challenge that that kind of uh, evolutionary system and, and organization, right? And so one um, imagery that's often adopted in this kind of line of thought that I operate with is this idea of the dual challenge of exploring and exploiting. You know, we're kind of both making money. We have ways of doing things that kind of work today. But we're of two things. Um, you know, uh, to paraphrase Rotter, you know, we're not, you know, we haven't figured it out. We're not in the best of all possible worlds. At the same time, the environment is shifting. But we need to both kind of leverage existing capabilities, ways of earning a living, at the same time, open to new possibilities. Um, and, and that seems to me kind of core to, to the resilience challenge. Yes. Would this be the final goal as well of resilience? I've been asking this of, of everyone because f in my view, when you talk about something that you need to achieve, you also need to understand how that would look like in the end. Did you, did you reach that goal or not? How does it look that you have finally achieved resilience? How would it look in, in your view? Yeah, it's interesting the way, uh, is there, like the way you phrase that. So, um, I'm going to give an answer you may like your country, which is, um, I, I don't think there is, there's not an end goal, okay? You know, 2020, we have a pandemic. 2023, there's some environmental crises. Um, so there's going to be a constant flow of challenge. We're living in this kind of dynamic open system. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, yeah, um, you know, so we have, we have processes that may, may enable and facilitate and organizations may have certain characteristics that kind of lend the resilience. Um, but, but I, I, you know, so we, we get a partial gold star for surviving this crisis. But, uh, was that luck? Was that chance? Was it cleverness? And is that cleverness going to be the right kind of cleverness um, for tomorrow's crisis? So I, I think in some ways, in being a kind of, um, you know, Andy Grove, one of those people who left their child to find Intel uh, at, at a kind of popular management book, uh, you know, or the paranoid and survive. That may be slightly overstating the case. But, but, but uh, you know, this idea that we'll never get too comfortable. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've never quite figured it out. We don't quite know know what's coming. So uh, it's that uh, more of that sensibility, I guess, that I would I would uh, uh, encourage, which is somewhat somewhat different orientation. But going back to your theory, whether it was luck or chance or just cleverness, it's still. Good, we are getting through it, and those who managed to thrive at the end of this crisis would have learned something. Even those who, who failed yeah. should have learned something well, and be better in the other. If another crisis hits, right? Yeah. So I think I think that's that's absolutely right. And I think, but there's also we can think about some sort of um, kind of deconstruct that. It seems really in two ways. Okay. So one way in which we may have done okay was, and I think quite common. We had some late initiative, or part of what we did turned out to be fit useful in this challenging environment. You know, we we're scaling our takeout delivery. You know, Zoom is taking off, so there's things being taken off. Um, there's a more subtle way, which I think you're also you're kind of uh, uh, referencing, which is we have processes, we have a mindset that facilitates us creatively in a fairly short span of time repurposing our initiatives our people our products in ways that are consonant with the current environment we're, we're shifting so i think it's kind of useful to distinguish between the sort of um in some sense the the content of, that we had kind of laying around and processes and ways of, of managing that are kind of um agnostic or independent of the particular crises uh, and, and whether it's been pandemic, climate change, what have you, um, those sort of higher level processes are what's going to kind of perhaps give some level of confidence about resilience in, in, in what may come down, uh, in, in future challenges. 
But now you've maybe ver- made me very interested and I'm very curious about your insight on 2020, on adaptation and learning. <coughs> how, how do you see this year from your lenses? Uh, did organizations adapt? Where did they fail? Could we have done better? What can we do to learn from this? Well, yeah, let me engage or begin to get my toes into this, okay? Um, first, I, I think at some level, um, yeah, there's lots of 2020 challenges, okay? They're, they're sort of, you know, ter- you know um, profound demand shocks to many products and services and, and a lot of pain associated with that. The other shock is to how we go about our lives, how we uh, how we operate in organizations, um, why you see me at my home and I see your home. Okay, uh, so so that's kind of uh, about work practices that include the shock shock is regarded both both those. Let me kind of you know tee up on, on the, the latter of those two about how we go about the business of work. Um, I think at some level, I think there's been a bit of a misunderstanding and so at least my view, some of the discourse around that. So I think the immediate concern seemed to be more of this sort of control loss. Um, but, you know, it's worth bearing in mind, before the coronavirus, it wasn't as if we all worked in the same cubicle. Okay, so uh, we've always been distributed. Uh, and, you know, yes, there's a matter of degree, but I, but I think it's kind of an you know, in the world of knowledge workers, you know, walking the hallways and seeing whether your part of work may make sense if you're a laborer on, on, on a physical plant. Um, as a knowledge worker, you know, where you're looking at your friend's Facebook, where you're writing a memo, that's kind of observation equivalent. So, so again, I think the control loss issue really is not the challenge. We, we, once we're in the knowledge world, we're, doing, uh, we're always we, we've been there already. Um, and actually, in that regard, I think so. Oh, people said, "Oh, wow, productivity is not really dropped." It turns out, you know, people's lives are challenging, and they may have their children climbing on them during a Zoom call or something. But, but you know, actually, that work. I think the the challenge is, um, I think, a little more subtle, more downstream, which is, I think, we have to be a little more careful about sort of. What did co-location bias uh, uh, or gen bias? And I think for me, it is the, you know, innovation comes out of these creative recombination. It comes out of the unanticipated. So, so it's the, the hallway conversation. It's the after the meeting, really, what did they mean? Well, where do you think we could go? It's lamenting to your colleague about your frustrations with the product or the, the project you're involved in. And then that kind of, transforming into this brainstorming session. So I think our distributed 2020 life is fine for sort of, in some sense, exploiting. It's fine for kind of getting the work done. We can sustain established relationships. What it fails on, what it raises is sort of the, the non-structure, the non-predicted, the happenstance that that serendipity coalition and so i think in the near term from a kind of just how we manage yes it's complicated we first had a set of problems and so on, but, but that's kind of a hit come i think actually the hit will be a little bit downstream where huh how come innovation first took a bit you know how come we're sort of doing our same pathways and i think you might also think about it in terms of like Wow, we onboarded these people, but they they don't kind of get our corporate culture. Well, gee, you know what? That kind of happened over lunch or drinks after work. Uh, and and so I, I think the sort of direct effects actually, I mean, it's profoundly impacting people's lives and it's incredibly challenging. But in this very narrow sense of, you know, does the work get done and so on? Yeah, actually. Pretty, pretty darn great. But these other kind of aspects of uh, for newcomers, can they imbue the corporate culture? You know, are we coming up with these sort of interesting, creative, new, new initiatives? Um, so I, I think there'll be a real latency effect, uh, but a, a pretty, pretty significant one uh, a little bit down, down the road. And so I think we, 
We may have learned the wrong lesson, but something certainly back here is more specific question. We're like, oh, hey, we're resilient. <laughs> you know, uh, the sausages are coming out of the sausage factory. We had to like work out a few hiccups, but 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 it's still still going on. And we may find kind of, you know, 18 months from now, whoa, huh. You know, we're really actually not quite as vibrant uh, as as we were previously, and it's not quite clear where sort of that next generation of whether employees or ideas uh, are, are are coming from. And so I think we have this kind of um, you know, back to some more generally about learning. Uh, Jim March, I would wrote this piece some some in my, my youth, <laughs> the, the myopia of learning. Learning is driven by feedback, right? So. The immediate cues in this country, oh, we learn, we're resilient, we learn, you know, we can really uh, climb these hurdles well. The, the consequences that have some temporal delay are a little trickier to learn. Uh, they don't show up uh, immediately. And, and, and to link, gee, why are the newcomers, you know, not quite as engaged as people? Oh, maybe it's these young people, you know, they don't, they're not like us, they grew up differently. You know, so the attribution became a little more complex in the learning. You know, what was it that why uh, they didn't get acculturated? Why didn't we? Why aren't we kind of coming up with quite the same rate of innovation we were previously? So the that attribution process gets gets trickier when when it's you know uh, uh, that that consequence outcomes are are a bit delayed. So I think we've kind of they've learned a little bit of a, a false reassurance. Uh, lesson. How can organizations form this habit of reflection and understanding? Have, have we really done something good? Will this really lead to learning and adaptation and us getting better and thriving? Or is what we were just lucky because we were in the right context at the right time and having the right people? Yeah, so um, you know, that that it, that that you know, you're sort of asking this sort of meta moment of, of sort of self-reflection in the after, after action. Um, I suspect uh, that breathtaking hasn't happened yet. So maybe maybe post-vaccine, uh, there'll be a kind of, well, let's take the corporate retreat. Uh, let's kind of do, you know, the military talks about after action reports. You know, okay, we were on the mission. You know, why did this happen? What could have happened, happened differently? Um, I'm not quite sure that that sort of broader bandwidth is 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 um, quite quite present. Um, but I think there, you know, I think a a sort of um, general humility and modesty, right? That's like again, we've never figured it out. Okay, you know, formally, um, you know, in, in computational theory, you know, these are non-solvable problems you know there's no ideal organizational form you know this this is kind of working but i think this sort of modesty of like it's kind of working but it can be different and 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 today's challenges may say we want to kind of um highlight certain kinds of um relationships certain kinds of uh ways in which reporting is happening and it's imperfect um but it's kind of highlighting what's sort of focal now, but have to be recognizing that, you know, in some future, open to sort of changing and re revisiting it. So I think this kind of, um, you know, broader sense of, of kind of continual renewal. And I think per your observation, we can think about renewal at multiple levels of analysis, right? There's the renewal of the particular products and services we offer, 18 months from now, maybe different we offer today. Um, but then there's sort of the structure renewal. You know, we thought the divisional form made sense. We thought these reporting relations made sense. Um, they kind of did, but they were imperfect. And, and, and not to kind of, you know, was the former a bad idea? Was it flawed? It was probably a, a reasonable structure for that time. And 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 these kinds of tweaking reinventions are actually what a healthy system 
uh, does. So, so back to sort of my, there is no end point. <laughs> there is no gold star, you're resilient. Uh, you know, it is a kind of, uh, you know, red queen, or what the biologist said, okay, yeah, the red queen and now it's you know, I'm running fast. Why am I running fast? So I can stand still, <laughs> okay? And, and organization, organizational five has a little bit of that challenge. Uh, you know, throw yourself a party on Friday afternoon, have a beer, the quarter went well. But Monday morning, we, you know, we're sort of back to, Okay, but are our markets changing a little bit? Is this, does this need tweaking? Really was this right? So I think this kind of eternal skepticism, which can be kind of annoying. It's not the easy way to live. Um, and you need to both kind of feel good about what you've accomplished. Um, but, but, but not sort of excessively comfortable. And then we're talking about experimentation. And this is one of the key elements, not only in your work, but everyone I've been talking to about resilience until now has been talking about experimentation as key. And some organizations, and we were just talking just five minutes before we started, some organizations understand better how to do this. Like you take the Googles and the Facebook who have the data and who have the analytical capacity and understanding that they need to experiment. Yeah. and allow for, uh, I don't know, 20% off from their uh, uh, right. employees so they can experiment themselves, really understand, hey, is this a good idea or not? And then uh, it gets implemented. Whereas still a lot of organizations don't do it. With some that I speak with uh, working in HR, they don't really understand how to grasp the idea. And when they s decide to run experimentations, they, they change so many factors that you cannot draw any kind of conclusion at the end. Right. So the, my conclusion is that they don't know how to do it. Some of them, they don't even think about it. Yeah. So you have been writing and talking about experimentation for a long time. How can organizations learn how to do that? Where should they start? And how should they think about experimentation? Maybe in a simpler way, in a way that they can start doing it and learn while they do it. Yeah, so it's a really fascinating set of issues that, as you say, you know, kind of you know, enormous kind of management challenges. And I guess I think one useful entry point is just to recognize um, the different sorts of quote experiments. Okay, and I think we kind of conflate. Part of we get in trouble by often get go by kind of conflating things at that level. So first, you know, there's the A/B trial. Okay, so Amazon, Facebook. Gee, we could present you with this kind of screen, the font size, these cues, these imageries, and we can see how people respond. And as you were suggesting, that, that kind of like the science experiment, we really have a, you know, uh, control, these are random populations, and we can kind of do that. Um, and that's really powerful, useful, but that's you know, at a very operational level. Okay. Um, you know, Amazon is not experiencing, oh, how about we start creating our own movies? <laughs> Those are strategic initiatives. So, so we kind of, you know, we sometimes, I think, extrapolate from the very well-defined, clear experimentation of the AB trial at that level of granularity to these broader, more strategic initiatives and so on. So I think, I mean, among the important kind of distinctions there, we're talking about, you know, the feedback and learning. So, you know, it's unambiguous. You did the trial. 10,000 customers, they respond in different ways. Now we'll, we'll try this versus the more HR challenge. Okay. So we're doing a quote experiment. We're going to have you spearhead this new initiative. Well, let's pause. Okay. Among the many ways that's different than the AB trial. Um, the AB trial, you know, the success of that initiative, it's hard to unpack. Did it fail because intrinsically it just wasn't that great idea? Or you know what? If you worked a little bit harder, if you were a little bit more clever, maybe, maybe it wasn't successful. So sometime back, Ron Adder and I did a piece a while back about we kind of critiqued or, um, the management literature enthusiasm with this idea of real options. And so like, well, you know, in a real option, the financial option, the price of Google would have you, or Tesla, uh, you know, that's independent of whether I decided to put some money down and buy the option, 
Okay. Uh, the AB trial, it's kind of exogenous. It set it up and it did it. You know, people responded. Um, but then when you get to these more sort of substantive managerial initiatives, as you say, it's not a controlled experiment. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're taking a risk. We're trying. Uh, and exactly as you're sort of interesting on the HR side, you know, upper management, it may look like, oh, we got a bundle of options. For you as that manager, it's not a bunch of options. It's your life. It's your career. Okay? Your prospects of that organization uh, depend upon how that thing is evaluated. And so it's vastly more complicated. So I think we kind of trivialize the problem often by, oh, it's like a financial option. It's like these A-B trials. No. Uh, it's a vastly more complicated where... You know, it is a joint consequences of merit, energy, talent. And so we have these kind of evaluation challenges. Um, among the other kinds of things is, you know, it didn't work out, but we discovered maybe B or C could be kind of interesting, right? And that's another way, which is different from option. Option is either we're in the money, we're going to exercise our option. Most initiatives are partial failures, partial successes. So how do we sort that through? And to make it, you know, again, even trickier is um, people's lives, the career consequences around that. Um, I had a PhD student a while back, Ishan Guler, did have examined these issues. And what should have been like, in some ways, is the easiest context. Uh, she looked at venture capitalists. And she studied, you know, the challenge they have in terminating these ventures, you know. And again, compared to a corporate context, you know, these are not people they hang out in lunchroom and, and so on. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be the tough love venture capitalists. And she found them sort of going back and refunding ventures that sort of by pretty, you know, reasonable objective measures, probably not a good idea. The conventional probability of seeing it. And she found, you know, that the capacity to terminate was a big driver of the rate of return of these ventures. You know, you're not throwing good money after bad. You're repurposing these other ways. So, even in the sort of um, relatively easy context where it's external, um, it's not easy to sort of say, oh, it doesn't have this future possibility. Um, I think the idea of pivot is interesting in this regard, both pragmatically and psychologically, uh, because the pivot is both, it's saying two things <laughs> at some broad level. It is both, um, you know what, it did work out, but it wasn't this complete abject fit. Okay. We are, we're leveraging something. I mean, you know, to be maybe in a silly way, you know, somewhat literal. Um, a pivot is not a leap. Okay. A leap is like, let's just try something profoundly new. No, it's one foot. I mean, we, we emphasize the, the doubt of the change. Um, but the other side of it is the continuity, you know, that there, there was something about that technology. We did kind of have something here. Some aspects of the market kind of got what we were up to. You know, there's something that we can leverage, but we're not a prisoner of this sort of like, you know, corporate plan. This is what we're going to do. And so it it allows for a kind of buyers, but it's not an experiment item. Okay. It is not like, you know, Louis Pasteur with his test tubes and something. Okay. It is a kind of, it's a journey. There's an openness to the feedback, the learning, the ways in which we adapt. And, and I think, um, so I think organizations do both, it seems to me, at a, to circle back. At a lower operational level, we can run experiments. You know, here it is clean. This, this, this device was better than this. You know, this way we present our website. We tune the algorithm. We're getting better traction. This way. Those, those truly are experiments. But a lot of what we do inside organizations are let's try some new initiatives. It's not kind of our current way of doing. It's not our current kind of product or services. But we think we can take some of our skills, take some of our people, and, and, and kind of go in this other direction. And then, okay, how do we evaluate it? And again, one of the, I think, really Difficult challenges of, of kind of the management is this piece about evaluation. Um, and so one of the things that I push from my sort of metaphoric evolutionary lens is um, one of the key roles of management in some sense is, is to serve a sort of selection buffer. Okay. 
the market feedback, you know, most new ventures, you're losing money, uh, but we think we're developing an interesting product. We think we're getting cut. So you create milestones. You sort of, well, yes, the market isn't responding. They're not snapping up our new, new device, but we, we see, and that's kind of, I talk about the market, the, the organization as an artificial selection environment. We have the sort of financial and commercial markets, the product markets that are buying, selling, evaluating. But in this kind of ecosystem as a firm, you can pick up your own rules. Now, it might be delusional. You change a couple of ways that kind of lead you adrift. But it may be that we see these hints of gradients of progress uh, in ways that are not going to be expressed in kind of market outcomes. And so it's all this piece of a very, you know, complex process. And, I, and again, I think by, by um, trivializing in some ways, and again, not that experiments are happy, but the thing that time, we're, we're, we're missing that. And as you, you know, you alluded to say the 20% time rule Google, which actually they took from 3M from a couple of decades earlier, right? I think that's really interesting in this regard because, you know, that's giving slack and saying, you know what, you're this interesting engineer. Uh, 20% of your time, you know, what do you think might be an interesting provocative idea? Maybe Gmail will make sense. But I think we still have to recognize that delays the selection of, uh, and resource allocation decision. It doesn't eliminate, right? So at a certain, so, but it's really important, right? Instead of going into your, 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 the, the vision head and saying, I have this idea for Gmail and it's this, you know, complete whiteboard ideation thing. You know, you might be able to come in with a working prototype and this is how it can link and this and so on. And so there's a little bit of credibility. And so it's really valuable. But, but at the end of the day, there still needs to be, Oh, I'm going to give you the resource, the engineers and so on to do this at scale, to make this a reality. So, so it, it, it I think it nicely illustrate this kind of open up to the sort of exploration kind of initiative. But but at the same time, recognize um, it doesn't solve fully the problem. It, it 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 allows the sort of initiative to be further down the road, maybe understood in in kind of um, a more insight and more insightful kind of informed way. But ultimately, that internal selection has has to happen, uh, and it's pretty unlikely that your twenty percent time activity led to some commercial outcome where you could just say, oh, you know. People are gobbling us off the shelves. You know, it's likely that you still are operating in this kind of internal selection environment. Um, so I think this kind of, and you know, I know part of your, your viewership, you know, the interest on the HR side, I think is enormously important uh, in these regards, right? This kind of, because uh, again, you know, the career con, what does it mean? Uh, it didn't work out and we understand that it didn't work out and, and whether it's a pivot or you're going to repurpose uh, in other ways and there's sort of a sense of goodwill, but obviously that can't be balanced. Okay. You know, the pivot, uh, you know, requires a couple of things. It requires, yes, we acknowledge that trajectory didn't quite work out and a kind of faith and confidence about that new path. But, you know, after four or five pivots, <laughs> presume that faith in time should in fact start 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 diminishing and maybe there's something about the actor's judgment uh, uh and it's not just this sort of uh bad luck outcome but that's a really difficult challenge to to navigate and i think actually in that regard i think it's interesting excuse me why perhaps pivots work well in the small organization it might be more challenging in the larger established firm because in the small, we're all around the same table or the same Zoom call. You know, there's a high level of, of communication, high level of trust. We're on the same page. Even if there is an outside venture capitalist, they're on 25% of those Zoom calls. Uh, there's some shared understanding. Inside a larger entity, I think that shared understanding be more challenging. You know, did did the higher up two levels up, maybe one level, kind of 
truly get the challenges and the ways in which this sort of worked, sort of did, why there's a logic. It wasn't me, you know, being adept as uh, carrying out this, this initiative. And so I think that kind of flexibility, and it's a kind of interesting irony because at some level, repurposing, you know, you're the big corporation of scale and scope. There's so many ways you could go. Uh, so, so lately you think, oh, that's the perfect context for these wonderful pivots. But I think this sort of, um, literal and psychological recontracting uh, are probably a little bit harder as the people you're recontracting with are a little more distant from the underlying initiative. And so I think that, I think it's a really interesting open question. We don't, it's sort of a 64 uh, billion euro or dollar kind of kind of issue that we really don't have a good glimmer on because I think we, we tend to trivialize uh, uh, the challenge, but I suspect that's part of why we we um, see it in the small and see it be so effectively in the small, and and I think see less evidence of it um, in in the established entity, which is sort of looking for you know clear metrics by which to make these decisions versus a, a more trust based, more grounded, phenomena based uh, discussion about the particulars of, of, of the content. Maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, the more established companies are supporting smaller companies, smaller startups to grow. And if the initiative in the end, and they culturally as well, and if they are fit, then they will be part of the biggest, orga the bigger organization. They will uh, swallow them at some point. Absolutely, right? And so right, they let that activity happen. And then when it's pretty clear, in fact, the working prototype actually works. Uh, let's, let's, uh, we can operate at this scale, link it to our, 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 our products and technologies. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, the big, and that's why, you know, some I write, I think the larger, it can take multiple bets. Um, but a bet versus a, you know, a pivot is a, a single trajectory that kind of zigzags. You know, a bet is I took n bets. Some set of them work, some don't, and then I walk away at the table. So the small, we only have a few resources. There are only eight of us, you know, either we're vectorized on programming this application or we're doing this other one. So it kind of, it's an interesting contrast between this sort of like, you know, we sort of have to be focused to get anything out the door, but because we're operating in this more linked way, the more, um, uh, we actually do have this sort of, the social trust uh, to pivot and and the large kind of yeah we we took some seed money in a bunch of ventures some of them will work some of them don't and we're operating more distant so yeah they they are kind of different ways of engaging that work for the different kind of enterprises. Then do you see some enemies to resilience? Some things or some yeah. Uh, mindsets that maybe you can pinpoint and say, yeah, this is definitely not going to help you thrive in adversity. So one thing, and again, maybe I'm pitching more to your, probably thinking about some of your audience at a psychological level, something I talk less about my work, but I think it's really important is, um, you know, is it framed as a threat or as an opportunity? So, you know, we have to do belt tightening. Okay, fine. That's, that's not fun, but we, we kind of get that. You know, the opportunity, you know, both framings are going to have a reality. The opportunity framing is, we think about our current crisis and challenges. Uh, there's been systemic change to the online world. Okay, there's been systemic change in distributed work. Uh, the coronavirus is a massive accelerant to those changes. So, you know, the opportunity framing is like, you know what? This Let's get ahead of the curve. The world is moving this way anyway. Now we're really forced and let's really own these changes that we sort of had some glimmer of, but we were successful enough that we didn't really have to confront. Uh, and let's not think about it as a kind of a blip, but we're never going to fully snap back. This is the time we're going to really hunker down and think about how we, how we change ourselves 
for for the way the technology and these platforms are moving us. And and you know both are going to have to happen, but and both are challenging. But but obviously the opportunity frame is like you know a little more positive, right? Like okay, you know I I see a future. I I can be creative. It's not just purely the downsizing and 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 letting go. So I think um, looking for sensitive to those alternative framing is, is important. I mean, so if we purely code it as a threat, it's both demoralizing and is not going to be ultimately well positioned. You uh, you may survive in the moment, but you're not going to be that well positioned in 2021 uh, because, in fact, this is even post-vaccine going to be a different different environment. Uh, I think, you know, sort of uh, hubris uh, kind of uh, attitude that we actually truly do know what we're doing versus, yeah, we have a clue. We've got some pretty good practices, but a little bit of humility. Uh, 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 and, and I think that's a helpful mindset uh, that we are always aware of kind of um, there are better ways of doing it. Um, and that's not saying we were incompetent, uh, we were fools. That's that's just life in a complex system and particularly a world that, that itself uh, is, is changing. So that's both a kind of a, a general sensibility uh, to, to take. And so that, that young person who comes in the office, you know, isn't annoying or not. <laughs> this, is what, this is what a healthy system uh does and I think you know part again my you know biological imagery yeah you know, we may live to a ripe old age of a hundred but our cells are going through a constant process of renewal we're not a fixed form you know? the reason we made it to a hundred is through this constant renewal process at a cellular level and and sometimes we have it easy because while human beings are messing with our egos our niche and it's getting problematic for homo sapiens but uh, that's a slow thing. Our, I know, but business organizations, you know, you know, we're just keeping our same form. Okay, maybe I lost some hair, but I still stand, and my limbs are still attached, doing pretty good. Um, but business organizations are constantly having to both maintain form. You know, people retire. I knew new people who have the skill, sensibility, have our culture, and simultaneously operating in new environments. And so, again, to kind of more this mindset. You know, yes, this is a, a, a bigger delta and it's happening in a bigger time, but but this is sort of at some level would be more our baseline sensibility. And if you you know to sort of adapt that as as the baseline, a healthy organization is letting things go, is adapting new initiatives, and that's that's success. <laughs> you know, that's success of as markers of, of resilience. Uh, and, and if we're operating that way, okay, we really got to speed that up in 2020. Um, but at some level, that's kind of a bit of our mindset uh, and, and, and orientation. And to say that we versus the threat, the complacency, we figured it out, uh, obviously, you know, deep, deeply problematic. To pull it all together, uh, I... You have a metaphor in one of your latest articles that talks about organizations uh, as canvases on which actors create. Can you speak to that? Yeah, actually, I mean, I was, um, I was actually drawing uh, a, 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 we, from a journal I edit, Strategy Science. Um, we had a special issue, which I uh, uh, um, deserve basically zero credit for, but I, I, I did. Well, in the spirit we're talking about, I found two really terrific people had good ideas and said, oh, you have great ideas. Uh, go ahead. So Vialona Mendova and Elizabeth Pontikis um, are organization sociologists and who delve a lot about these ideas of kind of um, actors influencing their environments. And so, you know, management professors sometimes wax poetic, you know, we talk about shaping and so on. Um, but they as scholars, okay, how do you affect kind of institutional norms, practices? You know, you're developing wind power. How do I convince people this is a good idea? How do I get the regulatory system on board? Uh, 
And so I, I wrote an intro to their lovely special issue and, and kind of offered a bit that, that imagery in part because, again, you know, I think part of the trick is back to the kind of, you know, uh, whether we think about pivoting, when we think about exploration and exploitation, um, he is learning guy as evolution. It's this duality of taking the old and projecting the new, taking what's available and creating something new. It's not, you know, what I object to and react negatively to is sort of the, the uh, you know, it's not Franz Kafka metamorphosis. You know, I went to bed as a man and I woke up as an insect. And sometimes our imagery is, no, there were sort of elements in the world and the organization and you creatively repurposed it. And so the sort of the paint, the canvas, some of it out there, but you're the artist, you're the creative genius who put it together uh, in, in a new new way. And in their own particular way, a little bit want to kind of tell, tell that story. But I think in a variety of ways, whether it's kind of how I shape my institutional environment, the farther the kind of initiative uh, as a business enterprise, as a social movement, uh, or as managing that enterprise. But I think it, it, it is that interesting duality uh, that, that, you know, good ideas, you know, I've done work on analogical reasoning. What is that? It's like I take prior instance and I project it into the current context. You know, so it's this kind of mapping and there is this kind of old, new re-leveraging in, in insight. And I, I think that, that um, you know, back to resilience, right? <laughs> that is, you know, it, it's about leverage. If it's wholly new, whoa. I'm in, I'm in trouble. And one of the, the lines I sometimes, you know, talking to um, audiences, I think about, you know, uh, you know, there's the, and, and one level of granularity, you know, we can think about life as a series of unique events. Be, oh, you know, we've never had this crisis. We didn't have the internet before. We don't have a pandemic. But I'm inclined as somebody who thinks about learning. Well, you know, if I think about life as a series of unique events, you know, I've never been on a Zoom call with you. Like, well, I think I'd end up in an insane asylum. <laughs> I have to be able to sort of leverage prior insights. Okay, I've been in other Zoom calls. I've kind of chatted about work before. But, um, and yes, the pandemic is different. But how, when we face some other instances of crises, how did we reassemble? How did we respond? What did we do in the financial crisis? Are there any insights we can take from there? You know, the internet is new, but you know what? We had TV broadcasting before, we had catalog before. Uh, so we have to recognize a novelty, but in ways in which there, there can be some prior, prior insights. Otherwise, yeah, it seems to me, well, my and, and, and reflection. And that's, that's the, the kind of dual mindset sensibility that I, that I sort of uh, encourage. Then, is there something that maybe I didn't ask you and you would like to leave the audience with? Buy my book. Uh, Oxford University Press coming out this, this uh, 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 summer. So I, I, um, my, my, you know, pulling on these things and my sort of, my metaphor, you know, kind of device, I talk about an evolutionary perspective on, on adaptation and Mendelian perspective. And so in the spirit of what we talking about, what I, I'm maybe somewhat bastardizing and maybe not quite, you know, it's not Mendel, but what I like about him as a imagery and as a kind of touchstone. So we, you know, we have a couple of big ideas about how things happen. You know, sort of a Darwinian process of this blind mutation and selection. We have these sort of godlike imagery of, you know, strategists at the chessboard and moving their pieces around. And back to my, you know, the gardener, the cultivation. The artificial selection environment, you know, Mendel sort of a, I, I try to use it as a carrier for that image, right? So there's this, you know, there's cultivation, there's intentionality, there's chance, uh, and there is the, the gardener's renewal. And so I think, I think it's a healthy mindset. I think there are particular practices and processes we could, we could have in mind, but I, I think, you know, that as an orientation and it's an uncomfortable or it's a, I think in election, we're not inclined to do that. Economists tend to operate in the, the godlike realm. I think, you know, we know what the Darwinian things look like. This is a sort of intermediate of, of kind of intentional rationality, 
in a multi-level system uh, and how it, it might evolve and, and have some of these properties. So, When will it be out? Uh, May, June. May, June. Okay. And what's the full title? So Evolutionary Perspective on Origins of Adaptation. I mean, or, 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 evolutionary Perspective, sorry, Evolutionary Perspective on Origins of Adaptation, colon, a Mandelian Perspective. Oxford University Press. Will it be available on Amazon as well? Probably not now. No, no, okay. Well, hold your breath. Okay. Perfect. But I will ask you, I will definitely ask you uh, next year again, and uh, okay. maybe we can uh, republish this we discussion with the link. Exactly. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, by the way. Okay. Well, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. It's so beautiful. Yes. For me, it was it was very, very interesting and very insightful. It, it's very good to talk with you. Very nice. Uh, great. Thank you so okay. much, Dan. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.